today is give you a bit of a tour. So I'll try my best to, to go quickly, but not too quickly. But it's going to be a little bit of a tour. I'm going to talk about emergency response, AI, uh, large language models, which is the topic of the day, AI in practice, and some research directions. This is an event that happened a few decades ago where the commuter noticed the wisp of smoke coming from under an escalator. That commuter informed one of the employees that there was smoke coming up from the escalator. The employee went down to check it out, put out the fire, then continued working. A few minutes later, somebody notified a police officer that there was a bit of fire, smoke, again, under an escalator. They called the safety inspector. The inspector went into the machine room of the escalator, but he couldn't operate the sprinkler system because he wasn't authorized to do so, and he didn't know how to do that. About 20 minutes later, another police officer was notified, and he couldn't use his radio in the tunnels, so he went up to street level, he finally called the fire department. So after several uh, attempts from commuters indicating that there was smoke under that escalator, it took more than 30 minutes for the fire department to show up. Does anyone recognize what this event was? This was a fire at King's Cross in London where 31 people died in 1987. And it's become kind of a, kind of a famous uh, case study, both in emergency response and in companies. So what, what went wrong? What failed? On one hand, various point-to-point -point communications, right? One person saw the smoke, told somebody else, somebody else, somebody else. The departments didn't communicate with each other. Um, and then there was slowness in, in the information getting to the right people at the right time. Now, if you forward to today, this was a post that I got on my Facebook feed back in 2019, but it still applies where somebody posted, and I think it was here on Long Island. Um, I, uh, I saw this abandoned duffel bag at the platform of, uh, at the train station. I called 911. They told me it was not their jurisdiction. They gave me a phone number to call. I called the other phone number. I waited for my train for 10 minutes. Nobody showed up, I took the train, and I just you know, went, went to work. Fortunately, nothing happened in this one. The bottom line is, even though emergency services are useful, uh, and by, by that I mean you know, 911, 911 and the numbers that you call in case of emergency, I'm not discouraging anyone from, from doing that. The centralized model basically means that you call 911, or whatever that emergency number is, and then a dispatcher decides who to send that information to, right? So there are multiple hops of uh, information that have to flow. In contrast, with public data, you have a broadcast model where the moment you publish something and you make it public, it's accessible by the entire world if it's, if it's truly public. The second part of that is that it's immediate, right? There's no waiting. You post it and it's there. Everybody has access to it. Lots of people get it, and people all over the world get it. So there's a huge difference in speed and, and range when that information is, is made public. And because of that, and the emergence of social media in the last 10 years or so, so many social media has really revolutionized the emergency response. Because people post stuff on social media when events are happening. We're seeing that now in the events in the Middle East, right? We see them every time there's a conflict. We see them every time there's a large scale emergency. And we see it when there are small emergencies as well. People see a traffic accident, they post something. They see a fire, they post something. So these are just a couple of quotes from, from people that work in the emergency response space. So the convergence of social networks and mobile is thrown out thrown out the old response uh, playbook out the window. And just during Sandy, which was in 2013, 10 years ago, more than 20 million Sandy-related tweets were sent out in spite of the loss, the loss of cell phone service. So it's become a very powerful tool for emergency response. 
when you think about this, you have to think about, well, what, what's an event in this scenario? Because people post a lot of stuff on social media, and it's not just social media. When you think of public data, it's social media, but it's also the dark web, it's the web, it's sensor data, it's video feeds, it's a lot of data. What's an event? Right? Anything can be an event. This is an event. Me raising my hand is an event. If you look at the dictionary definition, it's a thing that happens, especially one in the world. So you can see what I'm getting at. It's a very, very hard technical problem to identify events in, this mass, in these massive amounts of public information. One way to do that is to think of the five W's and the one H. What was the event? Who was involved? Where did it happen? When did it happen? Uh, why? How? So people have thought about this in the past and they've been working on it for some time. And then if you think about events and emergency events in particular, if I ask you without showing you a slide, you probably think of the big ones, right? Like the hurricane or the earthquake or maybe a conflict. But we don't often think about chemical emergencies, droughts, uh, fires, flu, obviously COVID-19 brought up to everyone's attention, food safety, heat waves, highway safety, hurricanes, survivors, landslides, nuclear explosions. I mean, this is something that uh, emergency planners worry about and they think about it and they try to plan ahead of time for. Poisoning, power outage, terrorism, obviously, and so on and so forth. So there are many, these are the big ones, and then there are the smaller ones. And I, and I had another slide uh, where I, I had a list of some of them, but I can remember one was one time uh, there was a raccoon in the subway in New York City. And it might seem funny, but in rush hour, a raccoon can really be disruptive and potentially be uh, dangerous, right? The other one was somebody throwing $100 bills on the tracks in, in Times Square. Uh, these are events that are important for public safety because people do things. So there are lots and lots of events happening all over the world. And why are they so complicated? Because emergency planners make a plan. They think, okay, this is what might happen in this scenario. But in most of these events, there are unexpected sub-events. And most of the events themselves are unexpected. They happen very, very quickly. They often have very large geographic spread. There's a ton of information, and it's not obvious what's useful and what's not. People post a lot of stuff, and they post a lot of noise. The information is very fragmented. You see this particularly with large-scale disasters like earthquakes, right? It's often the case that we learn there's an earthquake and the initial reports say 10 people dead, 30 minutes later it's 100 people, two hours later it's 1,000, 10,000, 20,000, right? It's very, very fragmented. One of the challenges that first responders have is logistics. And I learned this since I've been at data mining, which is, has been only more than five years. Uh, in evacuating a city like New York, the problem is not so much the buses. There are plenty of buses. It's getting the drivers to the buses because they also want to evacuate with their families. Right? So logistics. And to be able to act and respond to these large-scale events, you need to understand what's happening on the ground. And for that, uh, those emergency responders and planners need to know what's important. And then the platform, if there's a platform to do this, needs to identify what's important and to whom. And these events happen all over the world, right? Again, it's not only the big ones that we hear about, and I'll just use some, some examples. They have very different temporal and spatial distribution. One single individual getting shot, for instance, can have very significant political implications that lead to war, and we've seen this in, in history in the past. It's a very different type of event from a hurricane, where uh, that assassination, for, for example, may happen or would happen in a single instant in one very specific location, whereas a hurricane will cover thousands of square miles, in some cases multiple countries, and so on and so forth. And then the repercussions in terms of time, the scope in terms of time, can vary quite significantly. One of the things that's surprising when you think about emergencies is that they happen much more often than we imagine. This is a partial map, it's, it's older. I don't think it's from this year, or maybe it is, I don't know, I forgot. But, uh, it shows declared state of emergencies just in the United States in a single year. So there are lots and lots of them happening all, all the time. In terms of wildfires alone, uh, and without looking at the uh, 
the area is burned. The number of wildfires is huge. Again, we only hear about the big ones. And then natural disasters. This graph could be misleading because it shows that there's a significant increase, but it could be due to the fact that we're better at measuring these disasters worldwide than we were in the past. But there are lots of these going on. And then, of course, there's conflict and peacekeeping. And they're very related because the same kinds of techniques to identify events can apply. And again, we only hear about the big conflicts that are in the news, but there are a lot of people deployed in peacekeeping, peacekeeping operations all over the world. And uh, the number of conflicts fluctuates. Obviously, the, the good news, in spite of all the gloom, is that overall things are getting better if you look at, look at it statistically. But the thing that's in common to peacekeeping and emergency response is that peacekeepers and NGOs go into areas of conflict and they need to know about events that impact their safety or the safety of the people they're, they're, they're trying to protect. So they want to get that information quickly, as soon as possible. So the use cases, this is the only slide that I really have that's specific to data mining because it puts everything in context in terms of what we do and what a lot of the presentation is about. Basically ingesting Lots and lots of public data sources. At this point, it's about 800,000 data sources where Twitter is counted as one. Detecting events and then sending alerts about the events. That's kind of the core thing of what we do. And um, this applies to the public sector, Department of Defense, et cetera, et cetera, NGOs, the UN, corporate risk across all industries. Companies are interested in events that impact the safety of their employees, their executives, their assets, et cetera, et cetera. And then use and journalism. News outlets want to identify events that are newsworthy and it covers physical events, cyber events, executive protection, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the frame. We have all this data that's coming in. We want to detect events that are important, then we send them out to first responders, to companies, to news organizations, so they can properly respond. So let's now switch gears a little bit to AI and the role that AI can play in this kind of scenario. Uh, AI can be thought of as being two main categories. One is predictive and the other one is generative. In our case, in the predictive side, we're focused on detection, detecting the events in all of this data that's flowing in. And on the generative side, we're not interested in generating images, we're interested in generating summaries of those events. Because when you have so much data coming in, and so many events and some events within uh, a disaster or an emergency, you want to identify what's most important and put it in a concise, easy uh, yeah, way that's easy to, to, to digest. Now, at a higher level, AI is really about patterns, right? I'm sure many of you recognize the, what movie this is, this is from. But when you're building models, you're basically, you have data and you're trying to map those models to the data. So you kind of have to know what you're looking for to build the models so that they map to the data and then so that you can detect what it is that you're, you're interested in, in detecting. And in spite of the news and everything we've seen in the last year, uh, really since the launch of ChatGPT, AI has been around for quite some time. And some of the concepts go back to 380 BC and um, lots of developments in math and, and uh, computer science over the last few decades have taken us to where we are. Now, if we think of what an AI model is, it's typically a statistical machine, you, you could say, right? And in essence, what it does is it receives data and then it predicts a label, right? That's, that's the easiest way to think about AI. It's a black box where you take data and it'll label that data. Um, that label can be a prediction for the future, it can be a prediction for the past, or something about the present. In that case, we're not predicting the future, we're just labeling data that's coming in and identifying events and, and, and uh, what, what uh, those events are, and the different features of, of that event and what describes that event. But it can also be used to generate content. So you have input and then it generates content. One of the earlier systems from the 1960s was ELISA. I'm sure some of you have at least seen this before, but it was like a basic ChatGPT kind 
kind of system. And the idea was that uh, there are many ways of building that model, that box that I showed you. And one of the ways that might be easier is just to write down a set of rules. Where you say, if the input is this, then just say that. If the input is that, say that, et cetera, et cetera. And it's interesting because if you're smart about how you build those rules, you can get really interesting results out of it. In this particular one, the idea was to build a system that mimicked uh, a therapist, and they had people play with it and interact with the therapist, and many people thought it was human. So you can get away almost with passing the Turing test with just basic, simple rules. The problem with that set of approaches was that building the rules is actually not so easy. And one example of that is if you go to a doctor, the doctor will typically look at your symptoms and then make a diagnosis and say, well, you know, you're this age, uh, these are the symptoms you have. It's probably a cold, or it's probably COVID, or it's probably the flu. And then these are the next steps to take. So the doctor has a model in his head that in some ways is not different from an AI model. The doctor has learned from lots of training and so on and so forth. So when these systems were built initially, the idea was, well, we could just take these humans and ask them to tell us what the rules are. And then if we write down the rules, we can build a computer to do exactly what the doctor does. But it turns out that's really hard because experts are not that good at expressing what the rules are. Because I would assume that uh, humans use more than one system of learning. It's not just based on rules, right? So this, this sort of family of techniques didn't go as far as people expected. The other reason was that it was very difficult to manage those rules. But the reason I like to bring this one up is because it's still very powerful, and even systems like ChatGPT, although we don't know for sure because they're not open, we don't know what they do, it's very, very, very likely that they have rules included uh, in, in at least uh, uh, the safeguards that they, that they use. Now, if you take data and you have enough data, you can find this interesting pattern. So let's pretend for a second that it's a supermarket shopping data. And some of you may be familiar with this particular example. But if I gave you all the data of all the supermarkets in the US and I said, um, all right, tell me what item men buy when they go to buy diapers. Can anybody guess? If you know, if you know it, don't, don't, don't raise your hand. What could it be? Three, two, one. It's beer. Right, so this was a famous study. Again, very basic technique. It was done back in the 90s. But it said, essentially what you're doing is you're just counting. You, know, you put everything on the table and you just count the table and you, and you compute probabilities. And you can very easily find these really fascinating correlations. And you know what's the exciting thing about this is that when you think about large language models and all this stuff we're seeing now, it's actually not that different. In some ways, that's what they're doing. They're taking all this data and just computing stuff and counting and coming up with answers based on that. So even the older techniques are still very, very powerful if you have the data, if you have enough data, if you know how to use the data. In terms of the terminology, the term AI was coined in the 1950s, and for decades, it wasn't used in the technical research community because we felt it was science fiction. We were not going to actually reach AI, and so most of the work uh, was referred to as machine learning, which is a family of techniques where the designers of the system figure out what features to use. So let's say you're building a model to determine whether you give somebody a loan or not. In that particular case, in the machine learning techniques, a human would say, okay, let's look at the credit score, length of employment, age. Those are the three features. And then you have a bunch of many, many statistical techniques that can take training examples of people that have received the loan, people that have not received the loan, and then they will make a decision based on that. And you can see where the problems are with that approach, right? Um, deep learning techniques rely on a lot of data. They use a lot more compute. But you don't have to tell them what those features are. So you can just take all of the loans applica loan applications, but from one bank, it's not going to be enough. You take all the loan applications from all the banks in the United States, perhaps, and you put them all into the system, and the system will automatically determine which are the factors that, that were used in the training set to determine whether somebody gets a loan or not. 
So the key difference between the traditional machine learning techniques and the deep learning techniques is that deep learning is referred to as end-to-end -end learning because you just give it all the data and it does a lot of computations to figure out exactly what's important and what's not. And the designer has to work more with the, on figuring out what the architecture of the model is and how many nodes and so on and so forth. And it's, it's somewhat tailored after uh, models of the human brain, which basically says you have neurons, neurons are connected to other neurons and layers, and then layers are connected to other layers. So the earlier uh, neural networks were single layer with very few nodes. And then people started adding more layers, and then they hit a wall because it turned out that if you added more layers, you needed more compute, and the computers were not fast enough. So the whole field just got stuck for a number of decades. Until 2012, a group decided to try a larger network, so many more layers, with lots and lots of data, with a special type of processor called the GPU, which if you've heard the name of media, you, you might know what, what it is that they do. And they were very successful because now they had, given the, the, this kind of architecture, a lot of data, much faster compute, and a larger network, and the performance increased very significantly. It blew everyone away because it was so much better than anything that was there. So that kind of kick-started the deep learning era back in, in 2012. And that is still the base of all of the stuff that we see today. At the same time, because some of these simpler techniques are very powerful, they're still part of most large-scale industrial systems. So it shouldn't be assumed that in order for the AI to be good, it has to be always deep learning. It's, it's usually going to be a combination. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So again, AI falls into two categories, predictive and generative. And it's been around again for a while. I, I joined Yahoo in 2010, where I was director of research for a few years. And back in 2010, there was plenty of AI in serving ads and search and spam detection and news. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And it basically applies everywhere with their repetitive attack. So when people think, you know, am I ready to use AI? Can I use AI? The example that I often give is if you have a small kiosk on the corner and you start writing down when you're selling umbrellas and coffee and donuts and whatever, you'll find enough correlations. So if you have data and you have repetitive patterns and you can make useful predictions, you can use AI. So I think there are lots of opportunities across every industry to apply AI. The other way to look at AI is to think about the different types of content that it can process. Right? There's audio, there are images and video, text, and then sensor data. So just to give you some examples of how that might work in the post multimodal, which mixes all of them. Uh, in the computer vision space, the idea is you're given an image or a video, you want to identify labels, see, uh, label the scene, objects, and actions, right? And typically you can do this at multiple levels. You can classify the image, you can classify localized objects in the image, you can detect the objects without necessarily um, providing too much information about where they are or caring so much about where they are. And you can segment, so very detailed segmentation, which is useful in applications uh, like consumer photography, where you can start erasing people and moving people around and so on and so forth. For a computer, it's obviously just a set of numbers. It's a matrix of numbers, and so that's what the computer sees. And what the computer is doing is basically estimating probabilities. In this particular case, if you did a close-up of that patch, it might predict just based on the patch that it's not even a cat or a dog, that it's something else. But all of these predictions added up together might say that at the end of the day, the image may be 82% likely to be a cat, 50% likely to be a dog. And I don't know if you've seen it, there's this well-known experiment with muffins and, uh, I forgot the name of the dog, does anybody know? Uh, there are these dogs that look like muffins. And so these deep learning systems will confuse them. Humans can very easily tell which are the muffins and which are the dogs, but AI can't. I think it's a chihuahua. Chihuahua, yes. I'm sorry you have a chihuahua, I don't mean to be to offend a chihuahua. <laughs> but uh, it's probabilistic. These models make guesses based on the training data, and when you're looking at images, one way you think about it is they're going over the image and they're trying to 
identify what is there, make predictions for every part of the image, and then say, you know, this area looks like a car with 80%, this one looks like a bicycle with 70% probability, et cetera, et cetera. One of the challenges, one of the things that makes uh, perception, both in terms of speech and audio and, and visual, is that there's processing going on in the brain. How many of you see these dots moving? Or the other way around, how many of you don't see the dots moving? I don't, know, I don't know if it says anything about you whether you see them moving or not, but uh, most people will see them moving. I certainly see them moving, but they're not moving. This is just an, an image, it's, it's not an animation. So your brain is doing stuff, it's putting stuff together. So that makes it hard because it's, there's some subjectivity in the interpretation. Now, when we uh, look at audio, yeah. 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 Okay, raise your hand if you yeah. If you're hearing this, the word on the right, what about the other one? So it, it's pretty shocking, right? Because it's, it's, it's exactly the same uh, audio. We're hearing completely different things. Okay, let's switch gears now to LLMs. And I'm sure some of you remember the famous red dress or gold dress. That was a whole thing online or on the internet, right? Where people saw the same dress with different colors. So there's some subjectivity. Now let's move on to large language models because that is the topic of the day and everybody, when they walk out of here, I want you to go home and build one. <laughs> um, so this is an important topic. In essence, what large language models do is they predict the next word in a sentence. Using, in some ways, basic statistics. It's not really that, but it's a, it's a good simplification. If you took all of the words, everything that's on the internet, and you counted how many times the word impossible appears after nothing is, it's very likely that impossible would be pretty high up, right? So there's a pattern that's similar to the one with the shopping, the guy person, and the beer. It's a lot more complex than that, but in essence, that is what large language models do. They, they predict the next word in a sentence, or the next sentence in a paragraph, or the next paragraph in a book chapter, or the next chapter in the book, or the next pixel in an image, or the next object in an image, or the next piece of audio in an audio segment. Now that is mind boggling because it's extremely powerful because when you think about it that way, any data can fit that paradigm where you can predict what's next based on what you've seen. And the reality is our life is full of patterns, nature is full of patterns, our behavior is full of patterns. So when you think of it like that, imagine all of the opportunities in predicting the next thing, and that leads to many, many applications, right? Now, there's a distinction between the language models and the applications themselves. They are different, and something like Jack, ChatGPT and Big Chat and Bart, of course, these are closed systems. We don't know exactly how they're built, but they could be using more than one model underneath, they could be using rules. It's not just the model itself, right? And that's important. Now, let's talk about building large language models and how, how that works. They're also referred to as foundation models, and the basic idea is you train them with tons and tons of data, all of the web, all of the audio you can get, all of the books that have ever been published, all of the code that exists, et cetera, et cetera, you get the idea, right? You train them, when you train them, before you train them, you, you design the architecture. How many layers, how are they connected, there are a bunch of parameters, that's where you need expertise to do that. Then you press a button, and you train them on AWS, or Google Cloud, or Oracle, whatever cloud it is. Three, four, five months later, depending on the time period, you know, how big your model is, you get your uh, bill for 10 or 15 or 20 million dollars, uh, and your model is trained. Of course, that's not enough because then you have to tweak it again and train it again. And so there are a lot of techniques so that you don't just press the button and burn $20 million. Although people have, have done that. Uh, uh, you make a mistake and you don't fix it. But you, you build these foundation models, and then the idea is you adapt them to your use case and you have them perform specific tasks. So the foundation model is the big one, like the GPT 4, GPT 3. Uh, Lambda, etc. That they, they take months to train, they're trained with tons and tons of data. The interesting thing is that once you have those models, 
you can tweak them, you can modify them without having to completely retrain the entire thing. So it's like you have this model that learned everything about everything, it knows how to pass the bar exam, it knows how to code, it knows a ton of stuff, but you don't need all of that, you just need a small segment of what it does. So you can use your own data to teach it about your data and your specific problem to perform specific tasks. So that brings me to BERT in France. And um, if you haven't heard, if you don't know who BERT is, I mean, you should know at least from Sesame Street, but it's also a large language model that was released by Google back in 2018. And as we all scientists tend to do this, somebody comes up with a name and other people use similar names. So after BERT was released, people started releasing other models that had Sesame Street names. Uh, and then the last few months, it's more on animals. We have Lava, we have Falcon, like a bunch of so people create models and they, they give them names. But large language models are based on a technology called transformers. And there was a very influential paper from Google in 2017 that was called Attention is All You Need. And it was based on all ideas, but it did extend the framework uh, to, to make it more, more efficient and to be better performing. And then Google in 2018 released an open source version of one of these models, and they called it BERT, and they made it available to everyone. So what, what happened then? Companies like us took that BERT model and the many other models that started popping up, and we started adapting them and reusing them for our purposes. So we actually launched large type of models in production in, I think, 2020. I joined the company in 2018. But the other thing that was interesting was once these were released, people realized if we add more data and more layers, they actually do more interesting things. They work, they, they, they perform better in certain uh, applications. So companies and academics started experimenting. Like it became this gigantic experiment. You would go to a top conference like CDPR, and a lot of the papers were basically the same except more data, a tweak here, a tweak there. So it became a large community exper experiment where people were releasing these models and making them again open source so people could then take them, tweak them, and reuse them for different use cases, including commercial use. And that's the way that they're being used today in, in many scenarios. You have the foundation model, and then you adapt it by giving it your own data and train, retraining the subsection of that. And again, for detection and summarization. Now, this is an older graph from a few months ago. I haven't checked that recently in, on Hugging Face, which is a platform where people upload these models. But the last time I checked, there were about 100,000, over 100,000 models. Now, many of them are going to be complete nonsense and they don't really do anything. There are a few, maybe a handful that are really good, they're big, they're useful, etc., etc. But this is extremely important because it means that this te the technology is now in the hands of everyone. And this chart shows you the release of models, and you can see a tendency to both create larger models, and they come not just from the US, they come from China, they come from companies, they come from uh, academic institutions. One of the better models that was released recently, the Falcon models, are from a university in Abu Dhabi, right? And they're all basically built the same way. You take lots of data, you train it, and then you release the model, and then people can take that model and do stuff with it. So that's super exciting because it means it's democratized. Anyone can download any of these models and do stuff with it. You can't do it with OpenAI's models because they're behind the paywall and they're not going to be released commercially, but then you have Facebook releasing Llama, right? Where you can take that Llama and use it commercially for many, many applications. So the research community itself has changed completely, whereas in the past, the people working on building these models were a fairly small group going to conferences like this one uh, focused on academics. Now, it's pretty much anyone who, who cares about that. And many people are building tools that connect these models and that help them be more efficient and more effective. So here are some examples of things that uh, people have built. So the, 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 the lines that are kind of flat, they're not flat, but they don't grow as, as fast as the other ones, are um, software packages and tools that have been put forward by large companies like Google. 
or Facebook, right? So they've been the received adoption. This, the star history is, starts on GitHub. So basically, when you publish something on GitHub, you make it accessible to all developers, and people put stars on it if they like it. And I've heard from VCs that the number of stars can give you a lot of money. Because then if you come to a VC and you say, you know, my little toy thing has 10,000 stars on GitHub, they'll just give you a check. <laughs> and, and there are services now trying to, you know, determine the stars that are real versus ones that are fake. Anyway, here I'm showing uh, two or three. So Langchain, AutoGPT. These were tools that were built by people with no background in AI. Basically, gamers and software developers build tools that make it easier to train, adapt, and deploy these models. So the cat is out of the box. People with no specific experience in AI, they don't need a PhD, they don't need to know how to build these models, can connect them, can build stuff, and can deploy them. Now, that's amazing because there are so many good applications, but it also brings a lot of challenges. One of them, of course, Bad actors can use them to rapidly scale in terms of speed, right? Um, scale, the, the technical barrier is lower and lower every day. I'm able to download some of these models and, and use them on my 19, that's not 19, 2015 iMac. Uh, of course, they don't do everything, but I can, I can download one of these models and I can have a conversation and ask them how to make a model. And it will give me some information. Right? And of course, a lot of that information is already on the web, but it makes it a lot easier to, to get it. So a lot of room for disruption, especially in cyber and in sort of the information space. Core use cases of a platform to detect events in cyber include, of course, cyber physical convergence is a big one. Nowadays, if you can break into a computer system, you can break into a building, you can completely stop production in the plant, you can do all kinds of things. We saw this with the Colonial Pipeline um, a couple of years ago to detect vulnerabilities, external attack intelligence, digital risk, etc., etc. And the challenge is these things snowball very, very, very quickly. And this was one, one example with the movement of vulnerability where it's discovered and it may be impacting many, many systems and unless you act quickly, you may be clear. So the same techniques that can be used to generate damage, and, and one of the challenges is the way that I see it is, so it's a lot easier to pollute the ocean than it is to clean it up, right? So any single person can download one of these models, very quickly generate uh, lots of personalized phishing emails, for example, and all kinds of content. It's a lot harder to build a platform to detect it and get rid of it, right? But the advantages on, on the good side are similar. Speed, scope, and relevance. Only AI can detect in real time. Only it can, AI can address uh, the volume and the diversity of, of data. And only AI can deliver and prioritize at scale. One of the challenges that, that you will have, and we have, and everyone has, is with so many large language models, what, what do you do? Do you just pay open AI? Their, you know, whatever they, they charge for using their model, or do you use one of the open source ones? Unfortunately, if you're doing this at scale, it doesn't work to just use an API. And I'll show you some data on that one. But um, here's a chart that shows you different tasks on natural language processing in different models. And the colors just mean how good they are at those tasks in some academic benchmarks. So in essence, Different models are used are good for different things. There's no single model that's the best for everything, even though that is, in some ways, what some of the larger companies in OpenAI are trying to do. And there's a lot of good coming out of that, don't get me wrong. But in practice, if you have a choice, it's really quite hard. And here's another view of the same, kind of the same thing. So in exploring your options, so you're going to deploy AI in your organization, whether you're government or the private sector, or healthcare, or whatever that is, you have multiple options, right? Um, you can just buy applications that use AI in the background. You don't care what you're doing, you know, whether you're using large language models or not, it doesn't really matter, you just have an application. We see that with a lot of consumer-facing apps, which is pretty amazing, right? 
You have public APIs where you connect to, again, it could be Google, it could be AWS, Microsoft, OpenAI, whatever that is. And then you can build your own applications on top of that. You can take one of the open source models, modify it, customize it to your use case and deploy it, or you can build your own thing from scratch. Now, the per unit cost at scale goes down as you move further to the right. So the most expensive one is going to be you buy the application because there's all of that stuff around it, right? The next one is the public API, followed by the open source models, and so on and so forth. But as you move to the right, your technical skills have to be greater. Like you, you cannot customize a model or create a, a, a model from scratch if you don't have a lot of expertise in AI. But you can use an application without having a lot of expertise. So there's a very interesting trade-off to be made. So when you're trying to deploy AI and thinking about it, you need to consider these trade-offs and figure out what's best for you. And in some cases, you just want to get started quickly, the API will be the way to go for the application. But it's never going to scale the way you want it if you're, if you're working at really large scale. So the challenge is today with large language models, in fact, in spite of everything I said, cost is still pretty high. And again, I'll show you an example of that. Performance. If you're using a large large model like GPT-4, there are latency issues, there will be accuracy issues, um, how do you evaluate them? Prompt engineering, which is the task of asking the model questions and then changing the questions so that you get an answer. If you've used any of these, if you use Midjourney or Big Image Creator or ChatGPT, you'll notice that if you switch around the question, just switch two words, you might get a completely different answer. And in some cases, uh, an instruction to create something, an image that, that is, there's nothing negative about the image, the system might say, this is outside of my, uh, it's not safe, that's not a safe query. You just switch the order and then you get the, the image. That's prompt engineering. Today it's really just an art. There are some efforts to make it more into an engineering discipline, but it's very early. So that makes it hard, because you're working with a model and you don't know what it's going to do, depending on, on your inputs. Um, how stable it is is another one of those nations. And benchmarks, the tables I showed you that give you an indication of how good the models are, but that doesn't really tell you how good they are at your task, at what it is that you're doing. So in our case, we use those as a guide to, to get a sense of how good they might be, but to really determine which model we use, we have to run lots of experiments in our own data for our own specific use cases. And depending on where you are on that spectrum that I showed you from left to right, you're going to need lots of data, expertise, processes, and compute structure. The level of what you need there will, will again vary. But no matter what, you will need data for training and evaluation. A mistake people make is, okay, well, just use AI, but they don't have the right data. They don't have the right metrics to evaluate it and decide whether it's working or not. You're going to need engineering skills to integrate. You need to properly define the problems and then the processes to achieve your goals. And all of this with a responsible application of AI mindset, which in my view is more about the application itself. In terms of that data itself or publicly available information, it's kind of the same thing, right? You can just use an application, you can use public APIs, data repositories, or custom data, but your technical skills will go up as, as you move uh, to the right and your costs will, will go down. I talked about the costs of LLMs. This is something that somebody published in a blog, uh, but we see similar numbers. So something that for us may cost a few thousand dollars a day at Dataminer, if we used an API from one of these large companies, we would be paying millions of dollars for the same service with actually lower factors. So it's good if you're just starting, but once you scale, it doesn't, it doesn't quite work, right? Depends on how many requests you make. Application areas, there are many, and I'm not gonna spend much time on this, but uh, obviously across text, images, video, even video games. And where things are, it's worth, again, examining whatever your application is, what, what your needs are, and what the capabilities really are, and often it, it actually means testing it yourself. In speeding things up at scale, inference matters more than training. Inference is when you actually use the models to make decisions, not the training, because you train only once or a few times, but you're, you're running the models continuously, right? 
shifts in the distribution of input and output data over time put a lot of pressure on, on the methods and training that you use and all of those processes. In our case, every millisecond counts and it saves lives. Um, so you want to optimize pretty much everywhere. In terms of training and inference, oops, hardware, there are a lot of there's there are a lot of ways to optimize in hardware. Um, we use uh, specialized chips from AWS uh, called Inferentia, and other companies offer some of these as well. Not the same ones, but different types. There's a lot of optimization in software processing, uh, the processes themselves, and then combining complex and simple models. If you're doing this at scale, you want to run the more expensive models later in the chain than earlier in the chain. Right? I'm close to finished. I'm going to go over now on research directions. Um, even though I got to do the talk with half the screen and, and, and some of the slides didn't show, uh, I think we'll, we'll, we're not going to be way too over. In emergency response, in general, there are three phases to identifying these events and sending the alerts. One is identifying that it's an event, the second one is the extraction of the information, and then the last one is, is the execution. And Again, there's a lot of noise, right? So this includes things like, is the data relevant? Is it informative or not? Somebody in the hurricane, you know, some of those posts in social media are informative. They call for action, others do not, right? Who, what, where, and when, and then uh, deploying the actual resources to them. So popular tasks include things like informativeness, where you build models to detect whether a tweet or a social media post that's not from Twitter or X is informative or not. Does it ask for a, uh, does it require a monetary response? What kind of response is it? Does it come from, from uh, somebody who's an eyewitness or somebody who's just saying something that, that's happening 20,000 miles away? In terms of prediction, the challenge for AI includes things like context, reasoning, extraction is still very, very hard of some of these basic things. Summarization is still challenging, even with LLMs, many thousands sometimes billions of events. There are many ways of clustering these events and summarizing them, determining causality and, and how much detail is important in a, in a summary. Multimodal work is, is um, very promising because then you can mix evidence from different types of data. And, and, uh, there's a paper for that if you're interested, but uh, we published at CDPR in 2020, where we basically fuse text and image data in the same framework. Causality is another one that's super interesting and, and in some very specific domains, I think very promising when you try to determine the causal relationships between events. And obviously, if there's a fire, the fire will cause smoke longer term, and in a certain area it may cause health issues, etc. etc. So with LLMs in multimodality, Clip is one of the main ones that's open source for um, multimodal. Uh, Flamingo is another one. And then when you look at what they do, it, it, some of it is, is pretty basic, but they have the challenges that I described before. Cause, hallucinations, et cetera, et cetera. So to summarize, in terms of research topics, technical research topics, there are tons of them. And the way that I view it is, what we're doing, we're determining the value of information. And that is the hardest problem in AI. But it includes things like duplicate detection, integrating information from multiple sources in real time, real time corroboration, uh, again, from multiple sources, detecting some events, disinformation, deep face in AI generated content detection, optimization of large language models, that's a big one. Uh, knowledge graphs are super critical, hallucination mitigation, attribution. And there's a big gap between the state of the art and the real world that if, when you're actually doing this uh, at scale in, in, in this industry setting, you really have to look at bias, sampling, uh, sampling and seeing data, uh, cost performance trade-offs, the, the knowledge challenges from different stakeholders, what's relevant to whom, uh, and then situational awareness and actual deployment. So to summarize, I think the value of real-time AI is in multiple categories, clearly emergency response, cyber, it's a huge area because I think we're going to see a lot of impact on cyber because of this uh, surfacing of LLMs to the general public. Corporate risk, of course, is very tied to cyber, but also to physical events and everything else that's going on, and in news. And so that ends my talk. Thank you. If there are time for questions, I'll be happy to take it. But I'll be around later. Thank you.
behind the schedule, but uh, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Uh, so you, you, you talked a lot about the you know the cost associated with that and the economy and all that, right? So we passed, uh, the problem was that we don't have a huge uh, computation power and all that. Because of that, we could not take advantage. Now the problem is the cost is more, right? Because nobody figured out to make a lot of money out of it, uh, right? For example, ChatGPT is you have to pay, but for, for, you have to for not a lot of money for Meta, you don't have to pay. Right? Right. So the point I'm trying to get at is that when you think you'll get to the point where the cost will go so low that the government can be, you know, more than so the question is, when do I think the cost of the, uh, using these large these LLMs will go so low that everybody can use it? I guess yeah, that's the question. I think it's, yeah. Part of the problem is that these very large models like GPT-4, which powers ChatGPT, are trained on so much data that they're very big and they're very efficient. It's kind of, you, you want to go to the airport and you're hiring a limo that has a bathtub, it has lights, it has, you know, all kinds of things. You don't need all of that. You just need a regular taxi to take you to the airport. So for most actual applications, you're not going to need that gigantic model that is super expensive to run. So for now, the investment of the companies that are going to win are, are the ones that are going to uh, leverage their own data so they can take those big models and reduce them to the, the actual need because those are much cheaper to run. Now, the costs will continue to drop. I mean, even OpenAI has dropped their prices multiple times over the last few months, but the key difference is always going to be scale, right? When you're doing billions of trillions of computations, you can't afford to, to pay uh, at those levels. So I think what will continue to happen is that the community itself will continue to build these open source smaller models, many of which will be specific to industries or domains or companies. And I think that's where things will really start taking off. The big gigantic models are nice, and it's a nice, you know, we're going to build uh, AGI, but I don't think that's the way that it's going to pan out in the future because you don't really need all of that for most applications. Thank you. There's one in the back. Yeah. Are we good? One more. Yeah. one more. One more. We get the last one. Um, Related to real time AI, uh, one of my favorite metaphors comes from woodworking, and it says that you can run just as much wood with hand tools as you can with power tools, which is running a lot faster. Um, and so I'm curious, in when these are being deployed in real time, can you speak a little bit about some of the challenges of detecting that it's going off the rails as it's doing that at scale in real time and mitigating that damage? Thank you. Yeah, I think everybody heard the question. Uh, it is a challenge for all companies that are, that are applying AI in real time, and I think one of the biggest ways to address it is to change the internal processes. In traditional software, you build a software, you know what it's going to do, and you deploy it, and you're done. Right? You just add more features, and, and you monitor whether it's up or down. But with AI models, you have to monitor the performance of the models continuously and check that their outputs match what, what you're expecting. And that includes the guardrails. And, and in some ways, it's part of you know, the idea of responsible AI. So the way to do that is what we do today at, at DataMiner specifically. We're continuously monitoring these models and, and modifying them over time. And part of that is having teams of internal experts that help us do that, but also getting feedback from our customers when we make a mistake, when the platform makes a mistake. Um, but it's, it's a really important, it's a, diff, it's a very big shift in how we think about software deployment. And I think not everybody gets that. So I think it's a very important question. Thank you so much.